Um, so, uh, so uh, in this workshop, we've been mostly focusing on uh, 1D tensor networks. And I just uh, thought uh, I'll show at least the pictures for some of the tensor networks available for uh, two dimensions as well. But yeah, that's the most I'm going to talk about two dimensions, uh, show, the, show these pictures. So on the left-hand side are the popular tensor networks we've been talking about for one-dimensional systems. And right-hand side is two-dimensional. So this is the NPS. This structure can be generalized in a very natural way to what is called a tree tensor, uh, tree tensor network. That's what this is. And this is the MERA. This is what I'll be talking about today. And on the two-dimension side, this is a generalization of the NPS. So you can see that each tensor of the NPS is connected to two other tensors over here. And over here, each tensor of the PEPs, this is the PEPs, is connected to four other tensors. And once again, you have these free indices uh, coming out from each tensor, and these correspond to a site on your lattice. And this uh, probably, probably doesn't look very insightful, but it's the two-dimensional version of the mirror. <coughs> so uh, this talk is an introduction to the mirror, which is this structure. And once again, I'm going to focus only on uh, 1D systems. Uh, so uh, last time I introduced what a tensor network was, and basically tensor networks are a way to efficiently parameterize your uh, many-body wave function, and uh, an efficient param parameterization, in fact. And uh, I gave a specific example, the MPS, matrix product states. And I argued that uh, these are a natural variational class for describing ground states of gapped Hamiltonians. And I, and, and I showed this by, uh, by uh, proving or arguing that uh, if I take any MPS, the correlations in the MPS decay exponentially and the entanglement entropy saturates to a constant. So today I'm going to talk about this structure here and argue pretty much on, the similar, on, on similar lines that this structure is a natural uh, description for ground states of critical Hamiltonians. And so I'm going to show that just from the structural properties of this network, you can derive the, the scaling of entanglement and correlations that you expect to see in ground states of critical Hamiltonians. And uh, so I just wanted to request uh, Baskaran to just keep adding some uh, uh, insights about the RG perspective on all these things. So I just want to uh, recall one slide from last time. And this is my graphical notation, because I'm going to continue using this in this talk as well. And uh, this should really be clear, because if this is not clear, any, anything I say after this is not going to make sense. Um, so I just told you that a tensor is just a multidimensional array of complex numbers, so an object with some number of indices. And each index takes some number of values, uh, which, is, which I'm going to call the size of an index. And uh, th so objects like this are basically generalizations of vectors and matrices. So, and I'm going to graphically represent a tensor by a shape, such as a circle, and some lines coming out of it. So here are some examples. A ket, I'm going to draw a ket like this, a bra like this. A matrix is a tensor with two indices. And here is a tensor with three indices. And I also mentioned that if I fix a specific value of one of these indices, say c equal to 2, in the graphical notation, it just uh, corresponds to just erasing this index. So once I do that, what I'm left with is an object with uh, two indices. And that's a matrix. And it just corresponds to selecting a matrix from this collection of matrices here. So the same thing happens over here. If I fix a equal to 2, I'm left with an object with just this open index. That's a vector. And that corresponds to the second row. And if I fix both, that corresponds to a complex number. So fixing indices leads to erasing indices from the diagram. And now I can reverse this uh, uh, game as well. Given a matrix, so an uh, object with two indices, I can append an index which takes only one value without changing this object. So given any tensor, I can append these dummy indices, so indices with size one. And that's just effectively another way of looking at the same object. And it doesn't change. So it still looks like a matrix. And I also mentioned that uh, there's a simple rule for estimating the cost of all these contractions that uh, uh, we keep doing. And the rule is if, so you look at the diagram for the corresponding contraction, 
and identify the sizes of all these indices which appear in the contraction. And simply the product of these sizes would give you an estimate on the cost of the contraction. So at some places I would be interested in estimating some costs, so this is going to be useful there. So then let me tell you what the MERA is. So uh, a MERA belongs to a subset of the many body Hilbert space where the quantum, uh, where the many body wave function decomposes like this. So recall from last time that this tensor over here with n indices is just what I'm calling my many body state. It's just a graphical representation of the many body state. And each index over here corresponds to a site on my lattice and there are n such sites. And since this guy is a decomposition of this, the number of open indices have to match on both sides. So then each open index of the mirror corresponds to a site of the lattice and then there are n such uh, sites. And then once again, the size of all the internal indices that appear here is bounded by some chi, which I'm going to once again assume uh, to be uh, independent of n. Uh, so now consider that you were looking at a particular configuration on the lattice. So the first site is spin up, then spin up, then spin down, and so on. So that corresponds to fixing the value of these open indices. And like I just said, that would uh, imply just erasing these indices and what I'm left with is a circle and that's just a complex number within this tensor. And this is simply the amplitude of that configuration in this wave function. Now let me do the same thing here. So if I choose a particular configuration on my lattice, that would correspond to fixing the value on all these open indices here. So I would effectively erase them out. And what I'm left with is a diagram with no open legs. Now these hanging legs which appear on the right and uh, left, they are not open. So in fact, I put these connectors here and I'm going to assume periodic boundary conditions. So this diagram really closes on to itself. So left and right actually uh, connect. So you should think of this as being stuck on a cone, on a uh, birth ray cap. So after fixing all these indices, all these indices disappear and I have some number of tensors left which are connected and there are no open indices and now I can contract all these tensors to obtain a number and that number is precisely the amplitude for that uh, configuration. So what was a single number here is now represented as a contraction of these large number of tensors. So yeah, I mean at that first look this looks like a big mess and it looks like a lot of stuff is happening here. But indeed on, yes. So what happens at the topmost triangle there? There is no vertical leg huh? uh, So if, if this is a pure state, there would be no vertical leg. But you can in fact describe density matrices as well and then you would put a vertical leg here. But hopefully that will become clear in soon. So yeah, but on closer inspection one finds that there is some nice regular kind of structure going on here. So let's, let's have a closer look at what's going on here. At this stage, uh, I'm not saying anything like that, so they could in uh, principle be all different. So let's look more closely at what's happening. And the first thing to note about the mirror is that it can be thought of as being made of layers in the sense that tensors within a given layer are connected to one another in the same way. So here I've indicated the layers using these different colors. And you can see the tensors within each layer they are connected together in the same way. And you can also notice that the number of tensors in each layer, they keep decreasing. And in particular, if you sit down and count this, you would see that this layer has n tensors, this layer has n by 2 tensors, then n by 4, and so on. So as you proceed upwards, the number of tensors uh, are reducing by a factor of 2. So in particular, what that means is that the total number of tensors in this tensor network are just order n. So you just sum up n plus n plus n by 2 and so on. So that's order n. And each tensor over here has a number of components which is just some power of chi because all these indices take chi values. So this chi for instance has chi to the 4 uh, components. So the total number of components is just n times chi to the 4 order, order of this. So yeah, so it's at least efficient to store this structure in memory. That was just my point. So. Then the point of this slide is that the mirror is, can be thought of as made up of layers where tensors within each layers are connected in a similar way and these decrease, the number of tensors decrease as you proceed upwards. So, so, yeah. so, so at this stage, uh, the, uh, you, you are also alternating the ranks of tensors, right? So in the, in the square, there are fourth rank tensors. That's the, the next slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry for being so slow, but uh, uh, so now let's look more carefully at any one uh, layer in this uh, diagram. So what you see is that each layer is made up of two kinds of tensors, which I have differentiated by squares and triangles. Now I, I could have drawn them as circles, but it's just to make a distinction and to indicate there are two kinds of tensors at each layer. So like like uh, you just mentioned, so the square triangles, uh, the sorry, the square tensors have four indices and the triangle ones have three indices. So their ranks are different. And let me for fun just uh, give them names, but you don't have to worry too much about what these names mean. So these square tensors, I'm going to call them disentanglers. And the triangle ones, I'm going to call them isometries. And well, that you can understand because I mean, these are just isometries. Now these tensors are not any random arbitrary tensors and they actually fulfill certain constraints and these constraints are as follows. The disentanglers are unitary. So if I take a disentangler and contract with its adjoint, I get the identity. So straight lines are going to be identity. And this works the other way around as well. So u dagger with u also gives me the identity. On the other hand, the isometries, they fulfill this constraint. So if I contract an isometry with its adjoint, I get the identity, but not the other way around. So you can think of an isometry really as a product of a unitary and a projection. So they are, a un they are unitary in some subspace. So I just, yeah, so it, it would be nice to just take note of these properties because it's going to turn out that all properties of the MERA as a tensor network are, go are going to follow out just from these two uh, constraints. So th these are important. So, so far I've just shown you the MERA as a bunch of tensors which is connected together in some crazy way. Uh, but there are other ways of looking at what's going on in the structure. And in the rest of the talk now, I'm going to uh, explain four different ways of looking at the structure and trying to read what's happening there. So I will tell you that the MERA can be seen as a co-screening transformation or as an efficient description of ground states law of local Hamiltonians. And this, of course, is going to be my focal point. But I will also show you that it can be seen as a quantum circuit to prepare certain states on a quantum computer. And then I will very briefly uh, uh, mention this connection to the ADS-CFT uh, correspondence. So let's start with the first uh, perspective. So the MERA as a co-screening transformation. So co-screening transformation is just a transformation that allows me to systematically view my system at different length scales. So if I have a system, if, if, if I have the description of a system at some length scale, and by description I'm going to mean two, two things. One is I have the Hilbert space, and second I have my observables at that length scale. Uh, I could be interested in knowing the description of the same system at a larger length scale. So, co -screen so in order to do that, I need a co-screening transformation. So that would allow me to find out how the same uh, observables here look at a different length scale. So mathematically, a co-screening transformation is simply a linear map between a vector space and a smaller vector space, but one which preserves inner products. So you can also think of as a co uh, think of a co-screening transformation as an embedding of a small vector space into a large one. So if there are two vectors of some length and some angle in the small vector space, this embedding puts them into the larger vector space without distorting their lengths or the angle between them, but can rotate the two uh, vectors. So, right, so that, that's the generic definition of a co-screening transformation. And we've already seen an example of this. The subject we've been calling the isometry is in fact a co-screening transformation. So here Here you can reverse, yes, yes. Because we're going to preserve information at all length scales. We're not going to throw it off. Yeah. So we'll have a map which can take us up and down. So, so here's an example of a co screening transformation which we've already seen. So the subject now, which was just previously a tensor with three legs, I can in fact regard this as a linear map f by associating a vector space, a chi dimensional vector space on each of these indices. And then this is a linear map from the tensor product of this vector space with this vector space into this vector space. 
And this is a coarse grain transformation precisely because this object fulfills the constraints I showed you previously that if you contract uh, isometry with its joint, you get the identity. And this constraint is precisely the one which guarantees that the scalar products are preserved. Sorry? Yeah, right, right, right. So we, we are, so this is all coarse graining on a lattice. Right, so they're unitary in a subspace, so you can go back, yeah. So now having told you that one of these isometries is a coarse grain transformation, now let's look at, look again at one of the layers of the MERA, which is, which is simply uh, made of, uh, or which simply corresponds to applying several of these isometries in parallel. So then the MERA, so then a layer in the MERA can actually be seen as a coarse grain transformation on the entire lattice, which takes the original lattice and groups each uh, pair of two sites into single sites. But it's, it's so. But we do uh, something extra uh, than just uh, simply co-screening sites. Before actually co-screening them with the isometries, we apply these local unitaries on my uh, original lattice. And so this is my specific choice. I mean, I can always apply a unitary before co-screening because this unitary is not going to mess up with the scalar products either. So this whole transformation has. Uh, seen seen collectively is still a coarse grain transformation, still preserves scalar products. And this is the choice I'm making, so. Yeah, right. This is our, this is our choice for a coarse grain transformation. So, so, so can, can this, can this understand this? Yeah. So, so suppose, just, just for uh, uh, argument's sake, let's say I have two sites, thin half. So I have four states, uh, a singlet and two, three triplets. Right. So when I go uh, the next level, uh, am I just picking up the lowest singlet state of, uh, or, or some some one particular state? In the You're projecting onto a chi-dimensional subspace of that. Of so it. maybe throw away the singlet and keep only two states from the triplet. Right. So then I'm I'm pretty confused with Bhaskar's comment that you can go back because there is a projection. Right? So if I give you if I give you that last leg, how can I reconstruct? So that last leg is a many to one. Uh, so it's basically that your states which look very big on the original lattice, they, that's just an illusion in the sense you can, so these guys are giving you a basis in which you find out they, they in fact live in a small subspace. So given the tensor, you uniquely get the amplitude of what you want at the bottom. Given the tensor. Right, so yeah, I will say something about, so, so now let's just put a black box around all, all these tenses and now after we do that, what we see is that we have a single object over here with n indices coming down and n by 2 indices coming up. And this black box is what I'm calling a coarse screen transformation which takes me from this lattice to this lattice. So what I mean by that is that if I have the wave function of this, so you give me a ket on this and I apply this transformation, I get a ket on this lattice now, and that's just the coarse grain description, right? And these guys, because they are isometries and unitaries, they can be reversed in the relevant subspace. <laughs> so given a ket here, I can actually invert this, but I have to be a bit careful in the sense these <coughs> objects are singular if seen as matrices, but they are nonetheless unitary in some subspace. So I can, I can define its inverse as the adjoint of the unitary in that subspace and zero elsewhere, so don't uh, bother about the other uh, subspace. Sorry? Right, but from which it comes. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so if you come from a site over here, you will go to two sites here. But going this way, you will always go to one site. Um, so that was co-screening in the sense of wave functions. So if you have some, so that's how the lattice itself looks like under this transformation. 
Uh, now let's look at this in terms of co-screening operators because my co-screening transformation should tell me how the wave function transforms and as well as how my observables are going to transform. So, yeah. I'll, I'll come to that. Yes, yes. But this is a choice I'm making. I'm inserting this additionally. Right, right. So all these triangles taken on its own also define a co-screening transformation. But I'm going to insert this at this point just out of the air. The motivation will hopefully become clear by the end of the talk. It's like the density matrix. You choose the height of the... Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. I should, I'll make a comment on this later. But right now, let's just do it as a maths exercise, maybe, or a painting exercise. You know. So, uh, so let's say so. This is an operator that acts on on our original lattice. It's a local operator, so this could be a term in your Hamiltonian, a three-body term, and its identity elsewhere. And what we would like to find out is how this operator looks like on the co-screened lattice, and by means of this co-screened transformation, which we've defined. So how I'm going to transform this is apply the co-screen transformation here, and it's a joint here. That's how operators transform, right? So I've applied the co-screen transformation. So you should really see this as a big, back, a big black box, if that helps, which is acting on the entire Hilbert space. And this is the adjoint of this. Now, so in order to find out, so now these open indices over here, they are identified with the sites on the co-screen lattice. So if I contract this guy together, I'll get something with indices that live or, or which are associated with the co-screen sites. That's my co-screen version of this operator. But something looks wrong here. That is, I had a local operator over here. And somehow, it seems that I'm getting an operator which acts on all sides of the co-screen lattice. Now, that's not a good, uh, uh, that's not a desirable feature of a co-screen transformation. We want locality to be preserved. So, and we expect that nature respects locality at all length scales. So local operators should really map to local operators. And we see, indeed, if you look closely, that, that's what happens here as well. And what comes to rescue are, are these uh, favorite properties of these tenses. So the disentangles are unitary, and the isometries are isometries. So you would notice that several disentangles are connected to their respective adjoints. So evoking this property, these guys are going to cancel out. So these disentangles. And once they cancel out, they are going to leave certain isometries that are going to be connected to their adjoints. And then I'm going to evoke the second property and cancel them out. So really, the previous diagram was just there, there was a lot of hoopla, which didn't matter. And a lot of cancellations were possible. And in the end, what you're left with is this small uh, set of tensors that you have to contract. And there's no escape from here. So you just have to sit down and do this. And once you do that, you get a three-body term. So your three-body term on the original lattice is co-screened into an effective three-body term on the co-screened lattice as well. So that's what we wanted. And that, that's what, so th we wanted that as a feature in our co-screening uh, transformation. And let me also just mention that in order to co-screen our operator, we just had to actually make this contraction. And all the other contraction, we didn't have to actually make it. We got it for free. So the cost of doing this contraction is, again, once again, just some power of chi. The power itself is not important. The point is that it's independent of the size of the system. So it's some constant cost. So I just want to mention that as an aside right now. Suppose you do the same thing with MPS. How do you get it? Already similar things would happen. Right. So here, so the MPS also can be used to define a co-screening transformation. So here we are putting two sites into single sites. So an NPS, what it's doing is it's first putting two sites into a single side, then adding one side, then adding one side, and then adding one side. So it's a tree with only one branch, so to say. And let me also introduce one important object in the mirror, and this is the following. So I showed you that this is the small contraction I have to make in order to find my co-screened operator up here. Let me remove uh, this red object that is my specific operator that I want to uh, co-screen. Let me just remove that from the picture. So I'm just left with a hole here. And now what I have is some tensors which are connected together in some way. And now I can actually contract them together to get an object with some open indices. Now this object is just a super operator in the sense it takes op uh, operators to operators. 
So a simple operator takes vectors to vectors, and this is a super operator which takes uh, operators to operators. And this is going to be an important object. And this, in fact, is the object which is defining your uh, RG transformation, the co-screening transformation. So you can actually see that as, so instead of thinking of this whole line of uh, distant angles and isometry sitting here, you can just look at this if you're looking at how local operators co-screen. So this is called this, I'm going to call this the scaling super operator. It tells you how to scale. So that was uh, about a single layer of the Mera. Now in that picture, let's go back to the Mera as a whole. So what you see is that the Mera is just a concatenation of several of these co-screening transformations. So you start out with a lattice here, and then you obtain a co-screened lattice by applying one set of these unitaries and uh, isometries. And then you do this. So at, at this stage, you have already half the, site, uh, half the number of sites. And then you apply these set of uh, distant angles and isometries to get another co-screened lattice. And eventually, you reach the top where you left only with two sites. So this is the effective description of the entire lattice, but just in terms of two sites. Uh, so as a description of a many body wave function, what the Mera really is, is the description of the wave function at various length scales. So it resolves the wave function into length scales in the following sense that if you look at the Mera as it is drawn here, considering all the tensors that appear in this drawing, then that is the wave function that lives on this lattice. That's how the wave function looks like on this lattice. But now let me erase all these tensors in the first layer. Let me just erase this layer. And I'm left with a reduced Mera. So starting from here and ending over here, that's still a Mera. It has the same structure, but now it's reduced, fewer number of layers. And that, you just, uh, it's not even integrating because, you, so connecting them over here implies an integra integrating over, but now I'm just removing them. Just, I'm, so I had all these tensors together, and now I just forget about these. I mean, I just look at the network till here. And that is the wave function as it looks at length scale L1. And then so on. And then in the end, once you reach here, so you, let's say I cut out all, uh, all these tensors out, I'm left with this tensor at the top, which is simply the wave function of the entire lattice uh, as it appears on two sides. And just coming back to the previous questions, so it's a pure state. And that's because of this. Uh, so if, if you put an index here, I won't be talking about that, but that just means that you're keeping a subspace now. So it could be, for example, topological Keeping an index there? Right, 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 right. In fact, that, that's, so resolving into length scales precisely means that, that <laughs> what the structure is doing is that these tensors over here correspond to properties of the wave function at this length scale, and then so on. And this guy over here really corresponds to the properties that are relevant the, glo the global properties. And in fact, people who've used this, let's say, to find the grounds, uh, to represent the ground set of the toric code or other topological models, they end up seeing that all the information is really encoded in this top tensor. So that means that if I have a tensor there, and I just half like that, it comes down to a highly non-local operator. Right. Right, exactly. exactly. So, so that means if I have a topological degeneracy of 10, the final answer will be 0, 1 to n minus 1. Sorry, say that again. That is, if I have a, if I have a system with topological degeneracy of 10, right. that means when I reach the topmost state, I will get some number from that, that will answer will be one of the numbers from 0 to n minus 1 or 1 to n. Right, right. So, any, so and in fact, this tensor can be used to calculate the topological entropy. You just need this tensor. That's what I'm just trying to say. So that was about what the Mera has to say about, and in terms of the wave function, that's a resolution of the wave function in terms of length scales. Uh, let's think of the Mera now in terms of the co-screening uh, transformation on, on, on operators. And then we can simply see that the Mera defines an RG flow of these operators. So if you have your Hamiltonian on the bare, uh, on, on the bare lattice, by applying this co-screening transformation a number of times, you can see how your Hamiltonian looks like at various uh, length scales. So, and this, you can do this for any operator. So, you can look at the RG flow of any uh, operator. So, just a very brief aside. So, so far we've been considering isometries which take two sites into one site. 
but this structure, one can play a bit around with the structure, and one can actually consider isometries that take three sides into uh, one side. So it's again a different choice of a coarse graining transformation, but I don't want to emphasize, I mean, there's nothing special really here, but except that there is some freedom in playing around with the structure. But in practice, it turns out that this uh, form of the Mela is computationally more uh, easier to handle and less expensive. Uh, I mean, if I compare the tensors, they may not be the same, but expectation values of local observables and so on, they should agree for the same value of chi. So I'm going to just focus on the structure we've been looking at so far. Yeah. Right, right. And in fact, I think some people have looked at what the changing the structure, what kind of differences it uh, leads to. But I don't think there's a lot of work in this uh, direction. And usually people just stick to just taking one of these and doing their uh, calculations. So that was my first viewpoint. And in fact, oh, so I just forgot one thing. So, um, this also gets uh, interesting right at the critical point. So if, if I'm looking at the wave function, the critical point, I really want to consider a lattice of infinite sites. And then I'm going to use, so, and then my mirror effectively is going to extend uh, in the infinite direction on, and, in, and in the horizontal direction as well as in the scale direction. So I have a tensor network with really infinite number of tensors to describe ground states of uh, wave functions at the critical point. And the only meaningful way to manage such an infinite tensor network is by exploiting translational invariance along the horizontal direction and scale invariance along the uh, vertical direction. And we have these symmetries at the critical point. I'm going to assume, I mean, we have scale invariance, but I'm going to assume translation invariance as well. So translation invariance can be exploited to impose that all these disentanglers that appear in a given layer are, are equal and all the isometries are equal. And the scale invariance can be exploited to impose that disentanglers in different layers are also equal. So in the end, what you have is you just need to keep two tensors, so one disentangler and one isometry, and that characterizes your entire wave function. And then these same tensors are just connected in uh, this funny way. So in particular, what that means is that you're scaling super operator object, which for the finite case could in principle be different for different layers because it's made up of the disentanglers and isometries appearing at a given layer now is actually same at all layers. And this object is actually, uh, it, it turns out that this object can actually be used to characterize the underlying uh, conformal field theory. So you can find out the local scaling operators, uh, which are operators which are just mapped to themselves under the scaling transformation. And they're simply the eigenvectors of this uh, scaling operator. That's just an aside if someone's interested in that. So, and, and in, in this talk, I'm going to really be uh, just uh, looking at the infinite version of this mirror. So the next uh, viewpoint is uh, looking at the mirror as an efficient description of ground states of critical Hamiltonians on a classical computer. So this is the main problem that we've been looking for at, at so far, even with the MPS. So let me just say something about that. And really what I want to argue here is that it's an efficient description. So we've already seen that uh, the total number of components in the mirror grow linearly within. So it's efficient to store the mirror. Uh, now let's just see whether it's uh, efficient to extract expectation values from the mirror. And it's quite straightforward to see that it is. So this is the contraction I have to make. And this is similar to the kind of diagrams I do with the NPS as well. So I have the kit here. This is the kit mirror. This is the corresponding bra and my operator in between. So all the other edges are just uh, summed over. So I have, to I have to contract this, and this gives me a number. So once again, these dangling edges over here, they're not open. They're closed, connected together. So indeed, by contracting this, I get a number, and that's my expectation value. So I'm interested in finding out what the cost of this is. And the trick, the simple trick I can use is do this contraction layer by layer. So start at this operator, and first just contract it with this layer, one layer above it, and one layer below it. And this is nothing other than just finding the coarse-grained version of this operator. 
So then I can remove this segment and re just replace a co-screened version of this operator and then repeat that procedure. And I've already shown you that co-screening co has a constant cost, just some power of k. And there are just, and there are log n such steps uh, after which this operator is going to become just a two-site uh, operator here and that is a trivial contraction. So the total cost is really, uh, it scales as log n, so it's even less than n. But the other way of looking at the same contraction is that oh, let's not uh, do it layer by layer. Let's in fact look at what happens when I try to contract this together in one big shot. And by using the properties of the uh, descent anglers and isometries, what you find is that several of these descent anglers cancel out. And then once they cancel out, several of the isometries cancel out and so on. And in fact, what's only left in the contraction are tensors which, are, which lie in this uh, shaded region. This is called the causal cone of the mirror. And what it's precisely answering is that if I want to compute the reduced density matrix of this side, what are the tensors in my tensor network that contribute towards that uh, reduced density matrix? So that's the answer is that the tensors lying within this causal cone. An interesting feature of this causal cone, and in fact an important feature, is that the number of isometries and descent angles that appear at every layer is constant. So here there are two isometries, then they go to three, but then if there were more layers, you would see there would be only three at uh, every subsequent layer. And so we say that the width of this causal cone is bounded. So although it looks like something has exploded, that's only because I'm drawing these effective sites farther and farther away. But if I just count the number of sites that I intercept at each length scale, they're constant. And so why I'm talking about this? Because so last time I told you that a generic tensor network needs to satisfy two properties. One is I should be efficiently able to store it, and I should be efficiently able to extract expectation values from this. Now, this picture of the, this concept of the causal cone from the mirror, that can be generalized to tensor networks. And given any tensor network, I'm interested in finding out whether this is efficient for extracting expectation values. I ask the same question, that if I have to find the reduced density matrix of one side, what are the tensors within the tensor network that I have to consider, or which contribute towards that? Or in other words, I would find the causal cone of that site. And if that causal cone has a constant width or a bounded width, then that structure would be efficient. So this is just, uh, yeah. So this is just a, a side. So I've shown that a mirror can be stored efficiently. You can extract expectation values from it efficiently. But a real question, once again, is, is it good for representing ground states? And our claim, of course, is yes. And in fact, it's naturally suited for describing ground states of critical Hamiltonians. So remember what I told you about critical Hamiltonians? The correlations decay polynomially with the distance between the correlators, and the entanglement entropy grows as log L. Sorry? And now I'm going to argue that in any mirror, correlations decay polynomially and entropy grows as log L. So I did a similar argument for the MPS and it's going to be pretty much on the same lines. So once again, I want to emphasize that I have no Hamiltonian or, or any ground state at this point. So I just pick up any mirror from the Hilbert space and this could be just fill in some random values in these tenses and look at how correlations decay. And I would observe these. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the distance between them is L, so L to the power of some negative exponent. So let's look at correlations. And once again, I'm going to consider the infinite mirror. So this really extends to infinity on both sides and even in the vertical direction. But the vertical direction is we don't have to really go to the infinite. Uh, we really don't have to go to the infinite size. So this diagram is just like uh, the previous diagram for computing expectation values, except that you now have two operators. And now that is my infinite ket mirror and that is my infinite uh, bra mirror and all these other indices are going to be contracted. Now if these are separated by some distance L here, so let's put a black box around them. So it's going to be some L LL site operator here. After co-screening, it's going to shrink and become some, let's say L minus one or L minus two or yeah, it's going to shrink. And then exactly after log L steps, it's going to become a three site operator in this co-screening transformation. And then after that, it's going to remain a three site uh, operator. So let rho be the reduced density matrix at, uh, at that length scale where it becomes a three site operator. 
And simply the value of this diagram is the trace of row times the coarse grained version of this black box. And what is that? It's just my original operator and I've applied the scaling super operator log L times. So one, two and so on. So log L times and then I simply eigenvalue decompose this scaling super operator and you can uh, quickly argue that this value can be approximated as lambda to the log L and lambda to the log L can be rewritten as L to the log lambda and lambda can be shown to lie between 0 and 1 if the wave function is normalized. So that means it's a polynomial decay in correlations. So this is following strictly from this uh, structure and the structure of the network and these properties that the fact that these things cancel out, they play an, uh, an essential role in this. So quickly let me show you the same argument for the entanglement entropy. So once again we are interested in finding out the block entropy for a block of L contiguous sites on our original lattice and we want to show that this entropy is proportional to log L. And in fact the statement is equivalent to making a statement about the rank of this reduced sensory matrix that in fact the rank is some constant to the power log L. So you can just believe me right now that if this is true then this automatically follows. So I am going to prove this version. Um, so in order to find the rank of the reduced sensory matrix, I need to first find the reduced sensory matrix. So let me, sh and it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty straightforward to find the density matrix here. So what we see is that if I am looking at a block of L sites here, once again after log L steps, it is going to become a block of three sites. So let rho be the corresponding reduced sensory matrix again. And now I can derive the reduced sensory matrix here simply from this guy over here by reversing my RG flow. So I do it once. So I'm fine graining now. I do it twice and in general I would do it log L times till I reach my original lattice and I have to trace out everything uh, which lies outside my block. So now I can contract all these tensors together and I'm left with an object with L open legs above and L open legs below and that's just the reduced density matrix for my block. But I'm really interested in saying something about its rank. So let me not contract all these guys together in one shot. Let me partition this diagram into two pieces and then contract all the tensors lying above this partition into a single tensor and similarly all the tensors lying below it into a single tensor. So what I end up with is something like this. So this is nothing other than the, it is a decomposition of my reduced density matrix into two pieces such, uh, and, uh, into two pieces and I mentioned this last time that the size of this index simply the rank of the reduced sensory matrix. So we just have to estimate the size of this index and the size of this index is precisely the, the product of the sizes of all the indices which intercept this horizontal line. And the only important thing to notice here is that every layer in this fine grained transformation contributes two such lengths. So there are log L such fine grained transformations I have to do in general. So there will be log L such uh, lengths that I have to cut. So, and then I just multiply them, they are of size chi each. So I have shown that the rank of the reduced density matrix is just some constant to the power log L. That is what we, want, we wanted to show and then this follows straight off. So uh, in any mirror you see the scaling properties that you expect to see in ground states of critical Hamiltonians. So that is not a proof of anything once again but uh, it is it's, it's encouraging that uh, to at least use the MERA as a variational ansatz for finding these ground states. So one usually proceeds in a similar way to DMRG or some other variational algorithm in which you s start with a random MERA and say oh that's my ground state and then modify a few tensors such that the energy is lowered and call that your new ground state and then repeat this procedure until you convert somewhere, uh, hopefully close to your real ground state. Right, right. So people, so once you have the mirror for the ground state, you can actually l compute the critical <coughs> exponents and even other exponents and the, yeah, a lot of information. Yeah, okay, the, the inverse. Um, no, I don't think so. So this is in the end, we just find this numerically. And these tensors that you end up finding, they are really non-trivial. I mean, so it, would be hard to imagine that just given a central charge you can actually find out all these tensors. 
Uh, right, but then they will still find the ground state. So it is a Hamiltonian Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're looking at a Hamiltonian. They find the ground state, and then they find out. After given the mirror, they find out all these things. That is a good question. I think someone has looked at these kind of things, but I'm not really sure. But I think so. A lot of calculations have been done mainly with the three version of this mirror, and they get exponents in agreement. So I, I don't think these kind of properties should differ so much. But there's some paper out there comparing what, what happens when you change this uh, structure. So that was, in fact, the main part of my talk, and that's done. So there, my main point was, so even if you don't follow all these crazy diagrams, the main point was that I can use the MERA as an efficient description of ground states of critical Hamiltonians on a classical computer. So we're just doing it on our, on our laptop. But the same MERA, so once you've found this uh, ground state by variationally optimizing these parameters, you can view this uh, structure as a quantum circuit that prepares this ground state on a quantum computer. So one and two? Uh, the one and two, whatever you have said so far. Right. Because the repetition is required. But you wouldn't get the polynomial decay of correlations and. Without squares. Yeah, without squares. So, in fact, I'll mention yeah. the role played by the squares now. Right. But even at this, at, at the level of this point, the answer is that you would not get the polynomial decay of correlations and in ta uh, the log L behavior of entropy. So that really is, I mean, so th this is again going to come again in this picture that that's precisely the structure you need to capture these correlations. So what I want to do is that this is my ground state of a critical Hamiltonian, and I want to now see this as a sort of a quantum circuit. So in a quantum circuit basically means that you, it's a circuit which takes an input state to some entangled state. And usually there's a time direction. Uh, so I, I want to see the structure as some sort of a quantum circuit. And this is just, uh, I mean, all these pictures, they can be, they, they're not really complementary, and you can just think of them as additional perspectives on what's happening and mix and match and think about what's going on in your particular problem by getting insights from all these pictures. Um, so I'm going to do two small things in order to make this look more like a quantum circuit. The first thing I'm going to do is attach dummy indices to all my isometries. So one dummy index to each isometry. So I told you a dummy index is just an index which takes one value. And I can always take a tensor and add a dummy index without changing the, the thing. So I'm not changing anything. I'm just, so to say, just changing this picture. So each one of these dummy indices is, takes one value. And I've told you an isometry can be seen as a linear map by associating vector spaces to these indices. So one value would mean a vector space of one dimension, so a vector. Let me call this vector 0 at all my dummy indices. So spin down. And oh, yeah, that's just technicality. Yeah, so topmost two, just technicality. So more generally, there would be a third index here, just like every other isometry. And then I would just have to add one. So that's the first thing I had to do. And the second thing I'm going to do is reinterpret my scale dimension as a time. So increasing from top to down. And now I can start reading this guy as a quantum circuit in the following way. Let me start at time t is equal to 0. What I have is two spins which are in a product state. So they're not entangled. And then I just pass them through this isometry, which has the effect as it's a unitary gate. So it, it has the effect of entangling them. So I get these two outputs, which are basically an entangled state. And once I do that, I add two fresh qubits here, and then entangle one of the fresh qubits with one of the pre-existing entangled qubits, and same on the other side, to now get four qubits in the output, which are entangled. And I keep doing this. So at, at any level here, or at any time step, I, if I have a state of L entangled qubits, I add L fresh entangled qubits and entangle them to the pre-existing state by these local unitaries. That's the important point that at each step I'm just using local unitaries and that's the kind of quantum circuits you want to look at. Um, 
So if this picture is not very, uh, it, it, it's, it's not very appealing as it's drawn here, what you can just do is pull out all these blue lines, just pull them up so that all the zeros lie in one straight line. And then that's just a product state of n qubits. And by going, so basically what this mirror is doing, but all these gates are simply entangling, adding entanglement at every uh, length scale. And what you end up with is an entangled state of n qubits. So the mirror prepares an entangled state starting from a product state. And this entangled state is precisely your ground state. And that's because you have found out your tensors that correspond to the ground state. Right, 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 right. That's right. So it could be qubits or even higher spins. Right. So, yeah. Um, so seen from top to down or in, in increasing time, it looks like so the Mera is uh, creating an entangled state by adding entanglement at different time steps or different length scales. Let's just look at the same thing back in time. And this is just the inverse uh, picture that what the Mera then is doing is taking an entangled state and giving me a product state. So back in time, it's removing entanglement. And how it's removing it, it's removing it at different length scales. So removing some entanglement here, so these gates, and then some entanglement here, and some entanglement here, and so on. And that's the motivation of calling these guys uh, disentanglers in the other picture, because there we are really concerned with the scale dimension going from bottom to up uh, towards uh, the top of the board. So. Um, so does, does that answer your, uh, you, so you had a question about why these are, so these are disentanglers and they're removing entanglement. So if I had a pair of several sing singlets, this is my state. Suppose I were not to use the disentanglers and I just use these isometries, so I just co-screen these guys and let me group these guys into one and these guys into one, right? The point being that I don't know what the state is initially, so I'm actually, I could be grouping my sites this way. So then what I get is a state which is basically entangled like this. And then any more grouping of these sites is not going to remove this entanglement. So if I group this over here, I will still have correlations for, uh, flowing out from the boundary. But looking at the state, you know that there are only short range correlations that had you grouped the sites this way, you would have immediately reached to a product state. Right? So what the disentanglers are doing, they're ensuring that all local entanglement is removed before grouping. So disentanglers act on these sites and these sites and these sites. And what they will do is they will first convert, so remove entanglement and give me a product state. And then I will immediately, after applying one layer of disentanglers, end up with the product state. And then this grouping, it, it doesn't matter how I group these sites, I'll always get a, get a product so, state in the next step. So in practice, let's take the same point. When it gets disentangled, uh, product state, yeah. So let's say for, for a yeah for, for a singlet you can apply let's say the C naught. So the C naught gate will give me a, a product state of the spins. So in, for this case the disentanglers would be the C naught. But for general state where you have so so the idea of the mirror is that you are resolving the entanglement as well. So entanglement appears at various length scales, and the idea is that. So entanglement down here does not play role any role in determining the properties up here. So let me remove it before co-screening. So that's why it's multi scale, very scale. Right. And that's why it's so. Very crucial. Right, right, right. No. So is, is that more clear? So that's why you call it entanglement. So it's called entanglement renormalization. This particular scheme of co-screening, because you are renormalizing the entanglement before co-screening. And if you didn't do that, you could have situations like this where you could be looking at the wrong. Uh, so you would get some Hilbert space here, but that and that would be your effective Hilbert space. But you would require keeping many more states. So this has support on, let's say, a four-dimensional Hilbert space, and this would remain that way all the way up. So no matter no so no matter how many times you group your sites now, you cannot remove away these uh, the, these bonds. But in principle, you know that that shouldn't be the case. So I, I, let me just try to construct a mirror. So, suppose you give me the wave function. So what I would do is, uh, so the, 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 my initial uh, uh, Hilbert space is spanned by the side uh, uh, thing. Then what I will do is, I will find the density matrix associated with two sides. And I will write a base, a reduce, a, and then look at the eigenvalues of that pick the two largest fellows. And then write a basis at the next level in terms of the, in terms of the, 
eigenstates of the density matrix and so on, right? And keep doing this. Right, right. Project this wave function onto that. Right. If you want to do that by hand, that's what something like that you would do. You do. But then I, I also have another question, related question. So suppose I'm away from the critical state. Then what will happen is this will truncate and will become a product state. At exactly. Finite exactly. Right. 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 And otherwise, it'll, otherwise at it'll just keep going. There will be the same number of density matrix eigenvalues of the same magnitude at all states. Exactly. Exactly. So for gap system, the light will never get truncated. Yeah. So yeah. And you'll, yeah, you'll just end up with a product state there. You don't need to disentangle or apply any more disentanglers. So, yeah, that's enough. In fact, the product state is there. That's right. That's right. So, but that would be a trivial matrix product state of. Uh... So, that was my picture of the mirror as a quantum circuit. So finally, let me come to the dangerous part. So I don't know who's sitting in the audience. Oh, yes, our friend is here. And he's smiling. So yeah, yeah it's scary, actually. So, um, so this is a recent, so someone just recently pointed out that this crazy network that we've been looking at has something to do with the ADS CFT correspondence. And really, my purpose here is just to open this. And I would actually like some helpful comments from, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know much more than me here. But let me just briefly say what this is, this, color, this connection is about. So first I'm going to redraw my mirror in a different way. So this is how I've been drawing the mirror so far. Okay, and once again, remember that these left and right sides are connected together, so this is stuck on a cone. So let me take that cone and now squish it down from the, the top vertex. So from here, I just squish my cone down. So all the disentangles and isometries now just uh, radially flow on the plane. So this guy over here is this central tensor over here. And then all the other guys are just organized around it. Uh, just a fancy way of uh, redrawing my mirror. So someone is going to say something about what the ADS CFT correspondence is. But just let me give a very loose statement of what I think it is. Uh, and I'll just stick to 1 plus 1. So the ADS CFT correspondence says that if you have a conformal field theory in 1 plus 1, so this is, my, this is the picture of my space time, so the cylinder, so vertical direction time, and this is my spatial direction, periodic boundary conditions again. So my CFT is living on the circumference of this base here. And now this theory is dual to a gravity theory living in ADS two plus one, so one plus higher dimension. And this is my picture of ADS two plus one. So time again, and I have a, a spatial uh, dimension along the circumference, but I also have an emergent dimension, a radial dimension, which corresponds to a change of scale. And so the duality says that uh, this conformal field theory that's only defined on the circumference here is dual to a gravity theory, which lives in this entire uh, circle uh, plane. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Bulk of the cylinder. That's right, that's a bulk of the cylinder, that's right. But, yeah, but then coming to the mirror, what, and, and, and in fact, there's some sort of a dictionary which relates correlation functions within my CFT to geometric uh, quantities within the gravitational theory here. So, when now coming to the CFT, uh, sorry, now coming to the mirror, what we're really interested in is ground states. What we've really been talking about is ground states. So I'm not going to have this time dimension now. So I'm just going to be talking about this circle over here on which the CFT lives and this uh, base uh, plane over here uh, on which the gravitational theory or, or the state or the ground state of the ADS uh, of, of the gravity theory lives. So. What we've been trying so far is that we have come up with a structure which, and our motivation has just been to efficiently describe ground states of critical Hamiltonians. And now, of course, I mean, so, so given a critical point, uh, there's a conformal field theory which describes uh, this critical point. So then the ground state I have found, I can think of that as a discrete vacuum of this uh, CFT. So that's, so my motivation so far has been just that. I didn't think anything about any sort of a, uh, there's no gravitational context here, but what we, what, what so Brian Swingle, this observation was made by Brian Swingle at MIT, I think, and uh, 
he said that I think he works in string theory as well. Um, so he noted that uh, the structure that you are using to f describe these ground states can be seen as some sort of discretization of ADS space in 2 plus 1, only the spatial slice. So I don't have time. So, so the ground state of the CFT once again lives on the boundary because these open indices, remember, they are the ones which appeared at the lowermost uh, level on my usual uh, uh, diagram. So those are the sites of the actual lattice where the CFT is defined. And now, just in trying to define those or, or describe those states efficiently, I am using a structure which has an emergent scale dimension. So this Z over here corresponds to this uh, dimension which goes into the bulk. So in the actual correspondence, we also have this dictionary which relates correlation functions here and some, some uh, quantities here. So in this context, we don't have a dictionary yet, uh, but we can still relate the structure of entanglement and correlations here with some geometric properties of this network. So for instance, if I look at correlations between some site over here and some site over here separated by distance L, this is what we have also argued before, this, the correlation over here can be shown to be proportional to the exponential of minus one times the length of the minimal curve that connects these two sites within this uh, geometry. So let, let me look at this site and let's say this site. Now these sites are not directly connected by any link but nonetheless they are connected by a path through the network and there are several such paths. Let me choose the path of the smallest length. So I'm, go I'm, I'm going to take each link to have unit length and then uh, using that as my metric define a notion of a minimal uh, length. So in the correlations between these two sites are going to be proportional to the exponential of minus one times the length of that uh, minimal path. And the structure of the, once again due to the properties of these disentanglers and isometries that they're going to cancel out when I compute these correlation functions, what you will see is that the length of the minimal curve is log L. If these guys are L, then that is log L. And so by stipulating that the correlations grow as exponential to the minus log L, I recover the polynomial uh, correlations, which I've showed in my previous argument. But this may sound arbitrary at this point, but the good thing about this is now I can use the same definition and apply it to all tensor networks. So here the motivation was somehow to make a connection between correlations here and some geometric property of this network. But now I can go to the MPS and say, oh, once again, if I have two sites which are separated by distance L, the correlation between these sites are going to be exponential, uh, exponential to the minus one times the distance between the two sites within the network. And in the case of the MPS, there's nowhere else to go, so the distance is just L, if that's separated by L. So it's an exponential decay with the, with the distance between the two sites. And this, you can similarly classify the entanglement correlations in PEPs and all the other tensor networks I showed at, uh, on my first slide. So very loosely speaking, that is the end of the connection. Uh, but before concluding this talk, I wanted to show one more connection of the Mera and geometry, but uh, just hoping that it will have something to do with this, uh, something more to do with this ADS CFD business, but perhaps it doesn't have, so maybe that would be another open question. And that is a connection between Mera and spin networks. And this connection really is between any tensor network and spin networks, but here our discussion is Mera, so I'm going to just focus there. So a spin network is just a graph with edges labeled by irreducible representations of some group. I'm going to just stick to SU2. And the nodes are correspond to intertwiners of SU2. And these uh, spin networks, they keep popping up in several places. And I think the most popular place they come up with, uh, come up in is loop quantum gravity, where a spin network is, uh, or the set of spin networks forms a basis for states of uh, quantum space time. So correct me if I'm wrong. So, uh, so now, given so, um, right, sorry. So the left side, uh, is what you call a spin network. Yes. Some kind of amplitude. Yeah? It's a graph. Yeah, yeah. It, it can have no open indices in that. In that case, you can understand that to be an amplitude. So, so it's like a wave function. It can be. So you can describe a wave function as a spin network as well. So these are really states of uh, space time, quantum <coughs> space time, in loop quantum gravity. And the corresponding amplitude would correspond to taking one of these graphs and joining it with its adjoint, and then it's a graph with no open legs, once again. 
and you can contract this number and it would be some function of the recoupling coefficients of uh, SU2. So to make some connection there, what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to take my usual disentanglers and isometries and these were the ones which fulfilled my usual constraints. These are unitary and these are isometries. I'm going to still have that, but I'm going to impose additional constraints. So I'm going to choose a group SU2 and but these arguments are valid for any uh, compact and reducible group. So the constraints I'm going to impose are the following that uh, the isometries and disentanglers are going to be SU2 invariant. So if I take an isometry and apply and if, if I pick a group element from the group and apply it on all these indices, now of course it applies differently depending on whether the index is incoming and outgoing. So there are some arrows going in this direction. So once again incoming and outgoing. So if I apply these elements as matrices on these indices and contract this diagram, I see that the tensors are left invariant. I mean, not that I see, I'm, I'm going to impose, I'm going to choose tensors which fulfill this constraint. So now I'm considering a mirror which additionally in which the isometries and disentanglers, they uh, fulfill these constraints. And the second thing I'm going to do is rewrite my isometries and disentanglers in the total spin basis. Um, so here let me just show the isometries and the same thing holds for uh, the disentanglers. So once again, I, so I've mentioned that this object can be seen as a linear map between the vector spaces A and B uh, into vector space C. So since we have the group acting on all these edges now, so I can describe this vector space as a linear sum, it can, as, as, a, as a direct sum of irreducible representations of SU2. So here's an example. So this vector space is four dimensional. It has a singlet and a triplet, singlet and triplet. And this isometry, I've not made any truncation here, but in principle you can have truncation. But so without truncation, I obtain a Hilbert space where I can have two copies of a singlet and two copies of a triplet, a triplet and one copy of a spin two. Um, so basically, I can label the basis on each one of these indices by three numbers. So first I was just using a single number which takes chi values, but now I'm going to use the total spin, the spin along the z direction, and an additional spin, the degeneracy index, which basically helps me distinguish between states and different copies of the same irrep. So why I'm doing all this? So, oh, so you missed one? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I made this at 2 a.m. last night, so I was a bit dizzy. Um, right, so, so I'm just using a, 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 so this total spin basis on all, all these indices. And why I'm doing this is because there's a nice theorem called the wigner eckhart theorem, which says that if I have a tensor which is invariant under the, under the action of a group, it decomposes into two pieces. One piece has indices now only labeled by the degeneracy indices. And the second one is an intertwiner of SU2. So in this case, it's an intertwiner with three indices. So that's just a Klebs, uh, Klebs uh, Gordon coefficient. So yeah, that's just a standard result. And so the key point here is that notice that here my indices were labeled by three numbers each. And these guys are labeled now only by two numbers by the, so these tensors live in the degeneracy space of the irreps. And here they are just labeled by uh, the total spin and that's an intertwiner. So. so each isometry decomposes like this. Once I've chosen them to be a SU2 invariant, the same thing happens with disentanglers. Here's a more general intertwiner with four legs. And now let me take my mirror and since each one of these tensors uh, is SU2 invariant, so each one of these tensors is going to break into two pieces and in the end I'm going to left with, or, or sorry not left with, uh, in the end I'm going to have that the mirror decomposes like this into two pieces <coughs> and a superposition of two pieces like this and the sum is over all the spins that appear on all these internal edges. So this guy over here is some network or some operator on the degeneracy space, some, some, some coefficients. And, but this guy over here is a spin network. So all these edges are labeled by one of these guys and the nodes are intertwiners. So it turns out that by imposing these additional constraints on these tensors, now this new mirror, this SU2 invariant mirror is more appropriate to describe conformal field theories with a global SU2 symmetry. So I was just trying to describe global, uh, I was just trying to describe the ground states of the CFT and what I end up seeing is that the ground state decomposes as a superposition of many spin networks. So, right, right, right. So Heisenberg at critical point. 
So I don't know what this means, uh, whether this has anything to do with the previous thing, but once again, the structure has got the same ADS look and feel. So, and now you also have these pins sitting on the edges. So basically, that's all what I wanted to say, say, and that's my summary. So I've just told you that there are four different ways, and perhaps there are more, but I've just shown you four different ways of looking at the mirror. And my focus really was in telling you that it's an efficient description of ground states of critical Hamiltonians. So yeah, thanks. Go back a lot. <coughs> yeah. I, I would have, I, I would have thought that uh, this would be done differently. For example, my disentangler would have three legs coming in, and three legs going out, and my uh, uh, what was the other name for that? Isometries. Uh, isometry would have uh, uh, three legs coming in and one leg going out. Now that's another choice, but. Here we're just keeping the distant angles the same, so two body gates. This I see, I see. No, that, that's another choice. I mean, um, I see. So my the point I just wanted to make is that you can play around with the structure, and for instance, you can look at what happens when you uh, take that structure. But what I would expect is that the width of the corresponding causal cone would increase, which has a direct relevance to the computational cost of manipulating the structure. I see, but but the decrease of freedom at the next level. In, in this choice, yeah. one is like a site and the other is like a, a, a two-body state, right? The degrees no, of so freedom. so all these are just sites on the coarse grain lattice now. Right, right, right. But right. each one they of these corresponds of, to uh, three sites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so each one of these corresponds to three sites now on the original lattice. Right, but they're, 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 they're sort of asymmetric products in the sense that some sites are weighted differently. Oh, right, right. There, there's no, right, but we have the same problem. So even, even this structure is not translationally invariant. So if you shift the structure, shift you don't get the this thing. Right. So yeah. Square uh, object, right? The tensor. Square and the triangle. And one triangle. square and one triangle. Triangle is just a coarse grading, so that. But that's non-trivial, right? It's, a generic thing. it's it's projecting onto some non-trivial subspace. Okay, so square. So then, in the ADS safety context, that should basically correspond. That information is the information of the bulk, um, the, the gravity uh, action. The coarse graining? Yeah. The no, triangle? The oh, the whole thing. Well, right. right. That's, that's what you specify to evolve the wave. Right. Yeah. But it would be more interesting to, let's say, so I've just shown that how the structure of the correlations can be related to some geodesic structure in this, in this thing. But maybe I could have an expression for correlation functions on one side and some like area or I don't know what, or length or something on the other end. Yeah, that's there. But in this picture, I mean, it's not clear how that works. Uh, see, the usual RG, uh, whatever we study, is, uh, is basically nonlinear. Uh, the, the RG flow is, there is a nonlinearity inside that. Uh, that is because of the, it depends on the population dynamics kind of thing. The previous next step depends on the previous step. And, uh, so because of that, we have uh, two kinds of fixed points, uh, the attractor and the repeller. Uh, so it is the repeller which is more important for us for critical exponents and all. Here I don't see those kind of, uh, I mean you go, it appears to only one side. You don't go, that choice of going in both sides, I don't see it here. So the no, non in fact, business is not coming, even though your starting point is similar. Right, but in fact a site over here does go into several sites, so this, Cone which I showed. So one side over here is in fact related to several sites over here, has contributions to. So one side over here is connected to several sites at a larger length scale. And the other way around as well. So one site over here corresponds to several sites on a smaller uh, length scale. Yeah, but why don't we get both the two kinds of flows? You know, either you go towards that tractor or repair that. Why you don't get it here? So you're saying why the yeah. ascending super operator is only one? Yeah. That uniquely maps operators Even to operators? The starting point is similar. I, mean, I see. Both the RG starting point is same. So I don't know, maybe Baskin would have <coughs> something to say about this. this. But this is describing just the critical point, right? Yeah. So this is describing the state at the critical point. You can start from anywhere in which in the basin of attraction and you can take it 
So it could be possible depending on. <laughs> So minor clarification, I just needed some. So, so uh, in your slide where you define a critical system, you had two classifications. One was a gap system and the other system was a critical uh, yeah. system. So the critical system is basically uh, like uh, the limit of the gap going to zero. Is that is that what you That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and then uh, so which means that like systems like a uh, simple normal Fermi liquid would not be a critical system, uh, even though it has these features, where it's a gapless system. Right. Right. I see. So uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that requires changing the structure slightly to uh, right. adapt to these kind of. So that's one thing. And then the second clarification is that suppose you, um, the way you define entanglement entropy, does it uh, exclude the effects of Pauli exclusion principle? Or uh, let's say you take a normal non-interacting Fermi liquid, then that is an entangled system, uh, basically only because of Pauli exclusion. So, so someone else would have something to say about that, right? But over here, the only measure we're using is uh, this one Newman entropy. But yesterday, so where was, we had this talk on uh, looking at entanglement and in fermions and all, but the measure we are using is just one Newman entropy. I don't know. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Uh, entanglement usually means that you have a non entanglement. Not a physical entanglement. So, so, so there are no more questions. Let's thank. So